In today's episode of the Zista podcast, we're going to go behind the scenes in the field of game design and development. Welcome to the Zista podcast, where we invite industry leaders and academicians to answer questions that students have within a specific subject area. Today, we're talking about game design and development. Joining us is Janesha Gandhi. She's based in Helsinki, working as a CD producer at Red Hill Games, and has worked with big brands like Ubisoft and Massive Entertainment, just to name a few. Let's go straight into the session. Welcome to the podcast, Janesha. We're delighted that you're joining us here today. Yes, I'm happy to be here and talk uh, all games and maybe explain a bit about how, you know, what happens behind the beautiful games that you guys play. Fantastic. You're based in Helsinki, as I understand. How long have you been there? Uh, I've been here for two years now in Helsinki. I work for a company called Red Hill Games as a senior producer. So... Yeah, in a very cold country. I miss the sun now in India. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure in, in some bits and parts the food too, I would presume. Yes, yes, very much. Food, the sun, you don't appreciate it when you have it. And when you come here, you you miss it a lot. So, all right. So let's just jump straight into the session. Um, what inspired you to enter the field of game development? Uh, so for me, I think uh, when I was a kid, I I mean, I am a dyslexic. So my parents found out that I had dyslexia at a very young age and I could relate to art, drawing, you know, was very fascinated by how 3D is made, uh, played few games like Mario when it just started, uh, watched a lot of TV shows and I just knew I wanted to do something in the field of uh, 3D animation, graphics. And uh, then when I grew up, I did a course as well while I was studying for my uh, bachelor's in business management course. Got a job uh, in India, actually in Mumbai with Red Chilis as a 3D artist. Worked there for a year. Still felt that this is not, you know, I still didn't feel content. But then when I left and I went back to where I'm from, Ahmedabad, Got a job in mobile gaming, in project management. And once I got into the world of games, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. It's just passion. Something, you know, I've dreamt of doing is being a producer in video games. So it's just lucky to live my dream. Awesome. I think you're fortunate there, you know, not many people get a chance to live their dream. And the fact that you're doing that, uh, I'm sure that itself is uh, a price in itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the fact that, you know, you go to work every day, something and, and you love it. So you never get bored in video games. You actually don't get bored because there's so much to do. And there's so much goes on when you make, when you make an experience for players. So yeah, I mean, I love it. It's fun. <laughs> Chaos, but fun. Okay. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you, Janesha, you know, do you think that your educational background helped you in this journey? So when I wanted to study or join video games, there weren't any schools in India offering these courses. Right. So everything I learned about video games, I learned I learned at my job by doing, talking to people, experiencing, you know, failures, success, everything. So I guess now there are more options for students. You can learn, study and really see if this is something you're interested in. But uh, I guess... The fact I did a bit of 3D really helped in understanding uh, basics or you know basics of how or basics of how art works in video games. And as and when I joined the gaming industry, I understood how things are connected from programming standpoint, design, uh, testing. So personally, for me, it's just been learning on the job, which has been great. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, when you learn on the job, I think you learn skills which are absolutely relevant and required for the year and now and that preps you in a completely different way and you're right when you say that students do have a lot more options now than what maybe you had when you were a young student and uh, in some sense I feel all of us stay students for a lifetime right it's not that our learning journey ends uh, when we stop being a student in fact there's another learning journey that begins when you're a professional 
Yes, yes, I agree. I'm always learning. I uh, even being in the industry for ten years now, there's still so much to learn. So, it, so that's why I love the industry. You don't get bored. You can always learn new things, and you meet so many diverse people. So it's fun. All right, let's go a little deeper now, and let me ask you this. What's the most significant um, behind-the-scenes aspect of game development that aspiring gamers should know about? Um, I think if you you don't want to know about what goes on behind closed doors, I think in video games, a lot of people uh, don't see or don't understand that in games, things are connected with each other. So when we work, you know, us game devs, we, we have diverse teams even... Like, for example, if you have an art team, you will have animators, character artists, uh, environment artists, and quite a lot more VFX lighting. For design, you have game designers, level designers, programming, you have, you know, engine programmers, you have gameplay programmers. So the team is really huge. And because they bring a different skill set, it's very important to understand the dependencies and how each team works together with the other team. And how one change in the game or one error can cause an entire ripple effect. So this is something not a lot of people know, and no one teaches you. But you learn or how you learn when you work and you fail miserably. But I guess this has been a great learning on how to identify what comes next, what comes before, and um, you know, always keeping in mind the player point of view when you make a game. How like how do we serve players? Because our job is to make sure we sell an experience. Because that's why you play games. It's for the entire package. So to make the entire package is really really challenging. I can understand. So from your experience, there have been instances in the past where the mistake of of one team could have uh, involved a lot of rework for a large number of people. Can you give us maybe an example, if if you're okay with that? So, like, if I give you an example, more than a mistake, I would say a change because okay. in video games, we do a lot of, you know, trial and error research and development because, again, it's all us thinking and, uh, you know, uh, thinking of what players might do, how they're going to perceive things. So, uh, we test a lot of our ideas out as well. So, let's say, for example, um, if... Yeah, let's say for example, there is uh, there's a game mode we need to make. So if the designers, usually how it works is the design team, people who come up with the player experience part of it, they are the ones who come up with an idea or a pitch and then the art team needs to serve them, you know, talk to them and understand, okay, if you want the player to move from point A to point B, what, like, what do you want the player to do? Should the player you know, have combat, how will the scoring be? Will they die? Will they interact with the environment around you? So it's very important for us, I mean, for the other teams to know, which is why I spoke about dependencies. Right. Now, for now, if they say, yes, yes, we need, you know, maybe two combats, shooting and, you know, melee, like where you can stab your enemy. And then the art team, they will start working on it. Programmers will start working on it. Now, if the design changes, they're like, okay, no, we don't want any stabbing. We want the player to instead punch. So now again, it goes back into, okay, animators now create a punch sequence. Okay, the rigging artist will check how does it work. Maybe the character artist might have to do a pass to see that, okay, how is it looking? The programmers will have to change and write new code or, okay, a punch movement. So that's how it usually works. So one small change can have a ripple effect on many different people. So us producers, it's kind of like, you know, we have to make sure the changes are contained and people don't go rogue with changes. But that's how it works in a nutshell. I can imagine, yeah, you know, in the context of what you're describing here, it's really interesting. At the same time, it's really, you know, I would say a complicated, intricate web. And therefore, if you want to stick to some project timelines, I, I can imagine that as a producer, you got to say, okay, team, stop. We need to freeze this and move ahead, right? Yeah, yeah, it happens a lot. They're like, guys, yeah, 
but we have a deadline we have content lock and in game dev we work with different uh, milestones so we have something called a content lock where basically all the content which means you know more art related assets they need to be final like once you have a lock you cannot make new changes you work on bugs then you have data lock where basically programmers designers all of them need to finalize things and then it's just polishing after that so that's how we work with deadlines based on the project need if it's a live game you have uh, milestones maybe every month or once in two months you have you know you're always shipping new content for the player right so you have smaller scope and smaller time of doing cool things but then we manage <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that could be, uh, you know, completely different experience, right? As opposed to working uh, for a new game, you're looking at, you know, releasing some add-on element to an existing game with a shorter time frame, as you mentioned. So that can have its own set of challenges. Yeah, yeah. Usually, uh, I think when you make your own IP, it's so much harder because it's a new idea. And usually the ideas you think of are, it's never always the same that you push out because you know, production realities of budget, timeline, even technology constraints or you might have memory issues or does this make sense from a story standpoint? Will players like it? Market research, you know, what do people want? So making your own IP is a huge, huge, huge challenge. <laughs> For sure, compared to working on a game that's very established and has players and you have data to see what people like in the game, what people I don't like and what people want. So it's, I guess, a little bit easier to cater to what your players already want from you than going in, you know, coming up with a new idea and being like, okay, will they like it? How will people appreciate it? Will it work in the market? So it, they both are completely chaotic and different in their own way. I can imagine. Thanks for that. Um, Janisha, can you walk us through the journey of uh, a game idea from, say, in a concept stage all the way to uh, the final product? So, in brief, I could probably explain. Let's say you, uh, if you know, people have a game idea. Again, um, this is just my experience because each game dev company works, you know, slightly differently, and this is purely based on my experience. So, if a uh, you know, if a company has an idea, what they usually do is first, uh, you know, obviously you talk to the business people who are going to fund you because you need a lot of money when you make a new game. It's it's very expensive. You want to do a AAA game for sure. Then you pitch the idea. Wait for, you have basically in a team, you have directors, like you have an art director, you have a design director, you have a game director, creative director, narrative directors. So you have these leads who have a lot of expertise with their experience. So they come together and they, you know, they do sanity checks to see does the idea make sense? What is it that we can really do? Now, let's say everyone, even the production team, they say, yes, go ahead. The idea is good. Once, you know, once they say yes, then you start pre-production. So pre-production stage is where you do a lot of minimum viable products. You also do a lot of concepting like storyboarding, sketches. You see if the idea makes sense. You don't really make, you know, beautiful 3D assets or a beautiful level that's ready to be shipped. It's very gray boxed stuff just to understand that, okay, is it fun or the idea we have, does it make sense? So you might have your Unreal mannequin. Uh, you might reuse Unreal Engine with the mannequin you have and create gray boxes to see if, yeah, okay, I, I enjoy jumping here. Okay, this makes sense. I have a sword, which is just a gray sword. Okay, we can do fighting so you test a lot of things to see what makes a lot of sense and we producers are your party busters that's how we come in like sorry start making decisions now even in the pre-production you have deadlines so once once the team reaches a stage in pre-production where they feel they have a minimum you know viable product like a first playable 
So you have one level, which is a first playable. It, it doesn't have to be beautiful, but it has to make sense from a game design player standpoint. While the art team is working on concepting it and thinking about the world, how it will look, the visuals and the graphics. So once that goes ahead, everyone's happy. The money people are happy for going to give us funding. Then we get into production. So when you get into production stage, in production, you start making things a bit more tangible where you will get together, different teams get together with their leads and they are like, okay, characters, okay, we want a realistic character like, I don't know, Call of Duty, an army guy, and he should be able to have three guns. So these different teams, they sit and they discuss and they fine tune details. And then naturally, the production stage is very production heavy as well because we producers need to make sure that we have something shippable and tangible to show, you know, every month. In some cases, it really depends company to company. So in the production stage, we are making the game. We talk with everyone in the team. You have your designer, programmer, and you start making levels. You start making stories. You have audio. You have video. Uh, you also have VFX. You have everything happening. Like everyone's figuring things out, and slowly the wheels are in motion. So the production stage takes a really, really, really long time because this is a very crucial time as well because you are, you know. You have different milestones in production called Alpha Milestone, where basically you have the entire version of the game. It might not be very beautiful, but at least all the levels are there and you know what you want to do. Then you have a beta version, which comes much later, where it's kind of near to the final, but not really final before the polish, uh, you know, before the bug fixing polish phase, so that we can see how the game looks and how it's coming out. And after you pass this milestone, then you have polish, bug fixing, which again takes a bit of time. So a game dev process, depending on whether it's console, mobile, it takes a lot of time. A AAA console game, like some games, if you've heard of like God of War or Show, because they've been in production for like, what, five years <laughs> making the game. But, but it looks really cool because they invested so much time in making it. And it you have it takes a lot of time if you make new IPs. A mobile game is much shorter because the scale also of the game is really small. And they, they heavily depend on uh, monthly updates. You know, just so that players are not bored on mobile. So that's the gist of it. I guess once people work in video games, you'll understand it a bit more in depth. But that's the, you know, just a holistic view on how it works from ideation to the final stage. Wow, that was a really nice detailed answer. And you actually talked about so many different elements. I'm tempted to ask, uh, from all these different stages and different aspects of the game development process, which one do you see, uh, which one do you like coming to life? You know, what gives you joy? Um, I guess when... Uh... After the work we've done and when players play it, it's just so nice to see the reviews. It, you know, it doesn't have to be good always. You can't make everyone happy. But when you see the work that you've done with your team out there, even on the trailer, you're like, okay, wow, we did this. That feeling is so amazing yeah. because it's really, really, really hard to make a game. And that's something I tell most people when they talk to me, they're like, oh, it's cool, you're making a game and you have such a cool job. I'm like, it's really hard, it's chaos. That is game dev, it is chaos and we are here to just make things easy, I guess. But that's the fun also, because you learn so much. I can also imagine that in an environment like that, you're working with very charged, very passionate people. And if you don't have that same level of passion, you'll see a, a burnout, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I think game dev is very, like, you know, most people I work with or who I have, the only reason they make video games is because this is their passion. It's And those people who joined the gaming industry just to see what it is, they, you know, they left. In front of me, I've had people who are like, okay, we don't want to do this. We are better off in IT or other uh, or other sectors but then this is like it's very passion driven because you have to work hard maybe the returns initially might not 
be there. It's like going to the gym. It's very slow. You don't see it. But the day you see it, you're like, oh my God, we did this. Like, okay, wow, we made something so cool. And you're so proud of yourself. <laughs> I can imagine, you know, after you put in so much effort and you see that uh, consumer response, you're like, wow, it puts you on cloud nine, maybe a new definition of cloud nine. I can imagine. You know, I mean, you see your trailers or you have your uh, family play, friends play, and they're like, hey, we played the game you made and, uh, and you share the trailer like, hell, I did this with my team. That feeling is just out of the world. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Janesha. I wanted to ask you one more question uh, in terms of how, how as a company or as a, you know, or a particular, let's say a particular product that you're working on, how do you decide the level of realism versus the artistic style in the game's visual design? So in, in my experience, I guess it goes back to, you know, uh, what really, like let's say for a live game, if, if we work on a live game which is already set in stone they have their artistic style already set so that's quite straightforward you need to just adapt to their art style and start you know producing things in when it's a new ip there's a lot of discussion that happens within uh within the creative heads because they are the ones who need to make that decision more than producers because i mean they have the expertise of what really works doesn't work what art style you want to do and a lot of companies also they have people come from outside sign NDAs test it out or show their art you know just to get feedback from uh, different groups of people that okay what do you think of this character art style or environment art style is it, is it something that you know would speak to you is it too boring so I think this comes a lot in the pre-production stage because in the pre-production stage once your idea is finalized the team has to come up with an art style before production and it's a lot of trial and error. So it really depends on what vision the company has. Like if you see companies like Blizzard Entertainment, they have a very unique art style, which not a lot of companies do, but they are known for their art style. Like if you see any character from World of Warcraft or Overwatch, you know it's Blizzard. But that's how they have set themselves. You know, that that's how they've set themselves up. So, it, it, like I said, it, it really depends. <laughs> it makes sense. I guess some very personal choices, uh, setting standards, but uh, also I can imagine a lot of creativity in terms of how you want to take a particular idea, which direction you can take it, what level of detailing you go to, uh, whether you can complete that particular project within a stipulated time. So many variables to look at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of work. <laughs> So there are a lot of small moving pieces that you need to look at when you make in like, I tell a lot of people, even if you're just an artist or a programmer, your job is just not to make art or code. You know, we are game developers, even I'm a game developer. Like you have to understand the next person, the person before you, after you. You need to understand player. You have to play your game, which most people don't do, you know, in, in gaming companies. I guess they get they might not enjoy it a lot because you see it every day so it's kind of like okay I have to play it I have to play it no you have to you need to see you need to understand you should know what you know why you're doing this the question of why player is so important so there are a lot of questions we need to answer and there are no books to tell us <laughs> great I, you know, I really enjoyed this conversation, Janesha. I just want to say thank you for making time with your schedule and joining us. I really appreciated hearing from you and understanding so much about the world of gaming. Uh, a sneak peek, you know, I can imagine what you've shared is just a tip of the iceberg. The more you get into it, there are so many different layers, so many different elements that a student needs to uncover, unpack. But this was an amazing overview as well as, you know, some deep dives here and there. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed interacting with Janesha in this episode. She's super passionate about what she does. And it's pretty clear that if you want to succeed in the field of game design and development, you need to have tons of passion. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Keep getting content like this. 
The audio version of this podcast also goes live on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast and Spotify. Our handle is Zista Podcast. This is your host Amit Ahuja signing out. Till we meet again, we'd say stay curious.